2011, you volunteered to, uh, to go overseas. Why is that? Well, I actually volunteered in, in 2010. I'd been fishing around for deployment for a couple of years. Uh, I was one of those guys that uh, after about 25, 28 years in the, in the Army, the reserves had never deployed. Uh, I'd always had a civilian job. I'd always had a career. Uh, I was in Wainwright for three years once on Class B, but I'd always had something going on in my life that prevented me from going. Uh, one of the issues to get further advancement was I needed to get a resume, I needed to get a deployment on my resume. So uh, knowing some people in Ottawa and, and knocking on some doors, I started fishing around to see what I could get and I was hoping for Afghanistan. Uh, but instead I got a call in September, October of 2010 um, saying that yeah, I get picked up for the mission in Sierra Leone. So I was uh, originally picked up to go as the Task Force Sergeant Major in 2011. So I said, great, no problem. So we started getting that ready to go. Uh, I was contacted by another Chief Warrant Officer who was to go later, who was going to go actually before me, who needed to delay his deployment, and we flipped positions. Uh, he would go later as the, uh, deploy as the Task Force Sergeant Major in August of 2011. I ended up arriving in Sierra Leone on Operation Sculpture in May of 20, uh, 2011 as the Sergeant Major for Horton Academy, which was the, uh, for lack of a better description, staff college for the uh, Republic of Sierra Leone uh, Armed Forces for their officers. So what did your, uh, what did your family and friends think when you told them you were going to Africa? It's funny, you know, it's the reaction at the time because of course the war in Afghanistan was, was starting to wind down, but it had been in the news for years. And everybody was kind of like, why would you go to Africa? Well, first off, it was the only one offered to me. So I'll take it. And, and to be honest with you, it was a small mission, 10, 12 guys, 20 Brits or whatever. It, it had some unique aspects to it. Uh, I wanted to go to Sierra Leone as early as 2002, 2003. It just didn't transpire because of work. So given the opportunity to, to close that loop that I had wanted years earlier, it seemed like a pretty good idea. Uh, their reaction, um, friends were pretty good with it. Family were pretty good with it. My wife, not as keen as I was at the, at the first blush. She was a little more enthusiastic when we started talking about HLTA. Did she have some kind of concerns? Uh, well, it's Africa. Everybody's got concerns. It's, it's the big unknown. Nobody, you know, you, you see Afghanistan on the news. We know what the risks are. You see Kosovo, you see Bosnia, you know what the risks are. Nobody really knows anything about Africa. Uh, it really is the big unknown, and even in military circles, uh, not a whole lot of people have deployed to to um, to places like Sierra Leone in in a large perspective. You know, in in the ten or twelve years the mission ran, it's only seen about four hundred people from Canada. So, not, there really was a lot a lot of unknowns. So, uh, what did you do to get briefed up on what to expect there? Uh, I contacted a couple of uh, Patricia warrant officers, PPCLI warrant officers, who I knew. Uh, who had deployed. They were now uh, MWOs and chiefs and stuff and got a hold of them and they filled me in on what to expect from the mission. Went up to Edmonton, met one of them. Uh, he walked me through what he did. Met another guy up in Wainwright, uh, Kevin Keogh. He actually gave me the briefing package he had from having deployed in 2008 and 2009. So that gave me a, a fair bit of background to, to read into it. And I started reaching out to guys that were currently deployed because uh, I had some contact in, in uh, email and info to kind of get a sense of what the mission was about. So, uh, in hindsight, how adequate do you think your, uh, your workup training was? What was your workup training and how adequate was it? Well, my, my personal preparation was, was pretty adequate. Um, the preparation, which is unlike the battle groups which were going to Afghanistan, which were six to 12 months of buildup and working through all the theater mission specific stuff and, you know, 2,000 guys having to run through uh, CMTC and Wainwright. This was a case of uh, whoever was available was sent down to Kingston for three weeks at the uh, Peace Support Training Center to do uh, the three week pre-deployment for basically the odds and sods for all the missions around the world. If you're going as an add-on for two months in Afghanistan, you were there. If you're going to Op Jade in, uh, in Palestine, you were there. If you're going to Op Sculpture, you were there. If you were some d or CETA guy or girl out of Ottawa, you were there. So it was a real mishmash of, of folks who showed up in the theater and probably about 200 of us. And we basically got a three week uh, basic army training run through for it was you know it was real basic private level stuff for for where I'm at and where the guys who were deploying with us were but for some of the Navy guys with us and uh, certainly for our, uh, uh, our our training development guy or TDO it was a bit of an eye-opener trying to get you know teach them how to do basic map and compass and weapon skills and get them to qualify and so you know from a, a guy who'd been in the infantry his whole career it was uh, it was a pretty good three-week vacation in Kingston a good chance to meet the other guys on the team. Uh, but for some of the folks who uh, never deployed and never left their cubicles, it was a bit of an adventure for them. 
What did, what did you get in the way of uh, mission-specific training there? Uh, Mission-specific, we did get uh, an opportunity for uh, our desk officer out of uh, Ottawa to come down. Uh, he came down with a couple other folks and uh, they briefed us directly into the mission, uh, explained to us what we were going to find, what we were going to see there, uh, walked us through the cultural aspects of it, the social aspects, uh, the mission requirements, walked us through the administrative requirements of, of how, to, how, we were, how we would be handled and managed while we were at, at arm's length. Uh, unlike a lot of missions, uh, especially like Afghanistan, the administrative cell wasn't moving with us. Uh, we were 11 Canadians sitting in Freetown in, you know, relative comfort, but in, in a foreign country with our support arm in Ottawa. And that's, you're on your own, so you better get it right when you go. So, so based on what you gathered for yourself and what was pushed to you, wh what did you expect to encounter before you got there? What, was your, what were your expectations? Based on what I, in talking to other guys, I kind of had an expectation that uh, uh, it's, it's a busy place. Uh, I really, I wasn't prepared for when we arrived. We kind of, we arrive at nighttime. Uh, but you get there and it's, uh, it's, it's, I kind of expected to get in there, get picked up, get briefed in and, and kind of walk through like we, we do normally in Canada. Uh, but it was, you know, when you arrive at a new base and hand over to a job. Uh, it really didn't run that way. It was, it was a bit of a kind of a high speed uh, handoff with the other guy itching to get out of town. And uh, here's, you know, here's Freetown and here's Sierra Leone and drink it up and uh, see you in a week and off you go. So it was, uh, uh, I went in, I wasn't apprehensive, I was excited. I was, I was really keen to get there. Uh, and, but we don't move as a big group either. I, you know, I arrived on my own. So I flew uh, Calgary to London, London to, uh, to Freetown and arrived at, uh, at midnight. And, uh, you know, if you want your experience about being a minority, be one of the few white guys that gets off a plane at an airport in Africa where there's three or 400 other people and you're like, so that's what that's like. Okay, I got it. So what were your, uh, when you got off that plane at midnight, what were your first impressions? It's, uh, I think the one thing that's always stuck with me and not just uh, from that one time, but I think the, uh, you know, the sights and sounds of Africa are what they are. You remember stuff you see and you remember stuff you hear. It's, the, to be honest with you, it's the smells of places that have always stuck with me. Uh, or, or factory senses and, and memories are strong. And it's the, uh, the airport, which is crowded and, and it's full of people. And it's just that, that smell of mass humanity and, um, you know, biggest bugs I'd seen in a long time, uh, crawling around in the airport. And you're wondering what the heck's going on and no air conditioning. And you don't speak the language for a lot of people because a lot of folks are speaking a local dialect. And you're kind of hoping you're in the right line. So you get in the line with the, uh, the other uh, non-Indigenous personnel with you and the Chinese and the other white folks and you walk towards the counter and hope you get processed. And you work your way through and you show the guy your yellow fever card so you can keep on moving and get to the, uh, you know, uh, luggage bay to, to pick up your stuff and your stuff comes out and some local kid tries to grab it right away and make a couple of bucks off you and, and take it out to the car for you. But you kind of push him away. And as I walked out of the terminal, I met my, the guy I was replacing. Um, Master Warrant Officer Chad Gallant was there with uh, the Deputy Commander of the Mission, uh, Dan Jomey. And we met and uh, they knew who I was right away because I was the only guy with four barrack boxes. And then uh, off we went. We uh, piled into, uh, into a poda, which is a van, uh, crammed with more people than I thought a van could hold. And your luggage beats you down at the ferry dock and you get onto a little boat and it takes you for about 20, 30 minutes across uh, the harbour. You end up on the other side, you get into a Land Rover, you drive across the city and this is all at dark. So it's, it's pitch dark, it's midnight, one in the morning. You've been traveling for about 20, 22 hours. Uh, you're bouncing through the city at nighttime, which is, it's actually, I was surprised to see how busy the city was at one in the morning. Uh, and I discovered later that it's just simply too hot to work in the day. And a lot of the social activities and a lot of kind of local business for buying goods happens at nighttime. So you're driving along the road, there's little fires burning and little cooks, you know, cookhouses going and you weave your way through and eventually you, sh you show up at the IMAT camp. So at the end of your, your big journey for a day and a half, you drop your bags off, you, you know, get yourself a cold beer and wonder if you made the right decision. What was the, uh, uh, just describe the, the living conditions in the IMAT compound where you were. Well, the, the IMAT compound is, to be honest with you, it's a bit of an oasis in Freetown. Freetown's a, a city originally designed for about 700,000 people that houses, I'm going to guess probably close to about a million, million and a half right now, maybe even two million. Uh, it's pretty crowded. Uh, the IMAT compound is, is a fenced compound uh, built on a hill towards uh, the town of Leicester, towards the, I guess would be the southeast part of the uh, 
moving away from the peninsula. So it's on high ground. Uh, it's a walled compound, great, you know, uh, mo relatively modern construction by local standards. Uh, you know, running water, we got uh, clean water filtration, uh, security, barbed wire, you know, local security force. Uh, we have the only chlorinated pool in the country, although we'll call it a firefighting reservoir for now. Um, and just, it was, it was actually surprisingly good living. Um, the Canadian building, Arrowhead House, each guy basically got, a, got two rooms for himself and a bathroom in the middle, kind of a Jack and Jill setup. One room is your bedroom, another one's kind of your office, your living room, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, tiled floors, running water, you got your own shower. Two kitchens downstairs, kind of we split the team up and some guys use one kitchen, the Navy guys use the galley. They're pretty possessive about that. Uh, you know, TV room, common room, nice deck outside. The camp itself had a gymnasium, a mess, like a, like a bar to go to, the pool, and it was, it was actually pretty good living inside the camp. So not too, too bad at all. Tell me about the other, uh, what were the other Canadians in this team doing? What were their, what were their jobs? Yeah, it's a, well, we had the, the, the force commander who would work with uh, uh, essentially their version of the CDS's office, working over at the, the, the Army commander's office. Uh, the deputy commander was kind of doing a lot of that same level stuff. We had a training development officer, uh, a major in this case, uh, uh, a Navy guy who was over. He was helping to design training, work with them on that, uh, work with the RSLAF, the Republic of Sierra Leone Armed Forces, on uh, designing training with them. Um, who else did we have? We had a, a couple of training officers working at Horton Academy. Uh, we had a, a bosun from the Navy working with their maritime wing and a, a stoker, uh, uh, basically a, a maritime mechanic working with that wing as well. Uh, we had our medic with us as well and I was working over at Horton Academy and we also had the uh, task force uh, chief warrant officer, the sergeant major, who would work not only with the Canadians but with the other nations that were involved in, in IMAT. Uh, the British Army, which is about 20, 22 people, a couple of Americans, uh, a major from Ghana, and I, when I arrived, we had a, a captain from, uh, from Jamaica with us. What was it like working with the Brits? You know, I've, I'd worked with the Brits previously, and, and I have a pretty good fondness for them, and the, the Brits are what they are. Um, I think the Brit NCOs were, were pretty good. Uh, the Brit officers generally are pretty good. There's, there's personalities that get into things all the time. I think kind of the bigger issue for us, and we kind of had to get into it from a social perspective, was the dynamic of whoever the Canadian Sergeant Major is, because the Task Force Sergeant Major being a Canadian throughout. Um, the previous guy on the mission who will, will remain nameless for the interview, uh, he and the previous commander were, uh, just ran a difficult ship. Uh, they were not particularly sociable with uh, the British Army or with anybody else on the camp. They kind of kept the Canadians in a drawdown mode and the British NCOs on the camp kind of take the perspective that the Canadians were kind of anti-social with it. Um, so we had to work our way through that. And I think we lucked out. We had, we had a good group that was uh, pretty outgoing, pretty sociable, that wanted to get included, uh, wanted to include the Brits and everything. And I think we, uh, we knocked that barrier down relatively early, uh, with a, especially, particularly with a couple of key events, uh, where we, uh, we lowered our guard and let them know that we were just pretty good, pretty average guys. What about, um, what were your impressions of the uh, RSLAF? <sighs> Initial impression was, and, and, and I had to, I'll, I'll put, put that into two parts. I think for the staff perspective, the staff I worked with, the, uh, um, the majors and captains I worked over in the, in the school, uh, I, I found them to be a little wanting. They, they really weren't focused. They weren't driven. You know, if, if the objective for the day was to give you this much, that's all you were getting, if that much. Um, it, it turned out over time, they're, you know, they're pretty smart guys. They just, they don't have the tools and the background that we have to get to where they are. And we have to be conscious of that. Uh, when I did arrive on the ground, I got involved in teaching a uh, Sergeant Majors course. Uh, they had never run a, a DP4 kind of MWO level course for any of their NCOs. So this was kind of a, a trial project with myself and uh, Chief Warrant Officer out of Toronto were going to run. Uh, that was a bit of, that was really an eye-opener uh, for two reasons. Uh, I got there and the other chief was going on leave a week after I got there. So a week into being in Africa for the first time and a week into meeting all the, this other army and how they work, I was abandoned and left to my own devices for the final two weeks of the course. So thanks, Mike, that was great. Uh, that was the real eye-opener. I think learning what their, the expectation of their NCOs was, you know, we, we'd just been in seven or eight years of war uh, with Afghanistan and our NCO cadre had become pretty skilled. And so we had a pretty high expectation level of what our NCOs could do. And we got there and I, the expectation level was high for me and I had to adjust it to realize that they don't have the history, they don't have the skill set. And to a large degree, they don't have the backing of the officer corps to develop. And it was, that was a real eye-opener in terms of how to deal with guys. Uh, 
a really funny story. We were working through uh, things that Sergeant Majors would work with. So we were kind of working through problems that guys would have to deal with on camp or on base. And I kind of threw out a discussion question about uh, you're a Sergeant Major, you're an RSM, you've got a problem with one of your guys, you think maybe there's uh, some domestic issues at home with the wife, uh, you know, it's, it's starting to leak over to his work. How do you solve it? And I, and I looked across the room for about the 40 guys on this course, and it was just blank stares. And I thought, okay, I'll reword the question. And I, and I reworded it, but it's the same question. And I got the blank stares back again. And I, and I finally said, one of the guys, this older guy, uh, uh, Warrant Officer Tommy, and he was like the oldest guy in the, in the RSLAF. He was actually the, the sergeant major for the band. And he's, he was a good guy. He had seven sons and one daughter and had lived in the PMQ patch his entire life. And he looks at me and he goes, it's not our position to solve that problem. So I said, well, is that like the officer or the adjutant that somebody does it? He goes, no, no, it'll be Mama Queen. So I looked at him and said, I'm not familiar with this, this Mama Queen. And he goes, well, Mama Queen, is she rules uh, the housing where everybody lives. I said, so she's in the military? He goes, no, 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 she's not. So I, as I continue to draw the information of the guy, what I discover is the highest ranking guy living in the PMQ patch or the senior guy, his wife is now de facto the most powerful woman in the PMQ patch. So while he goes to work and does his army thing, she runs the PMQ patch. So any issues that are family related that happen in the PMQ patch, she has final say. So in the case of if your, your kids are out stealing stuff or ripping off the neighbors, she can decide that your family is being evicted from the PMQ patch. If your wife is fooling around on you and she figures it out, she can evict your wife from the PMQ patch. So that was pretty much a real eye opener that whatever cultural social issues we're going to throw out for discussion, I really had to rejig a lot of my questions based on what the expectation level was locally and so that the problems were relevant for them. So it was, it was actually a real, uh, that was education point number one for me. So that was actually uh, pretty amusing. So you used the term relevant. How, how relevant do you think their NCO core was at that time? Uh, to, to be honest, for a large degree, irrelevant. Um, I think it's, it had been developing over years, but one of the issues we ran into uh, as much as we as Canadians were keen on, on teaching the NCO Corps, uh, the mandate for IMAT, which was to, to work with and develop the, uh, the RSLAF Army to work with the government and work with the population, the British Army had never really focused on training the NCOs. Um, at the battalion level, the, at, for the, the guys who were working out in the field, the, uh, the British trainers and sergeants, they did a pretty good job of it. But from the, uh, the grosso modo perspective, the big, the big hand perspective, the staff officers for the British Army really had no desire to. They didn't see a need to train NCOs, to train warrant officers and sergeant majors to work their way up like we do. Uh, one of the issues there was probably, uh, we in Canada have a firm belief in the, um, the command team concept, where we focus at the, uh, the major and the, and the sergeant major, the, the captain, the warrant, the CO and the RSM move together as best as possible. And they're a team that functions together and supports each other. Uh, not only is that non-existent in the RSAF Army, it's really non-existent to a large degree, especially at the Chief Warrant Officer level, the RSM level, in the British Army. They don't put a lot of stock into the command team, or certainly the officers that were there didn't. So it was a bit of a, a push from our side to, to teach. Um, and there'd been you know, decades of basically officers within the RSLAF who just ignored the NCOs. Uh, and in talking with, with the NCOs, and I had, you know, we had the Forces Chief Adams Camara on staff with us with the course, uh, certainly it would have been a Forces Chief for us, but he was theirs for whatever reason. Uh, and in talking with him, he just said, there are times in their career, like the NCOs who were there now, the warrant officers and sergeant majors, these are the guys who had fought in the Civil War. These are the guys with the war fighting experience in their army. Their officers were all young, with the exception of the CDS at the general staff level. The young captains and majors had no war fighting experience, but they wouldn't seek any advice from the NCOs that were there, because that's just not how they were raised. So yeah, they were largely uh, an ir irrelevant structure within their army. And we were doing our best to teach them. I think that we weren't going to give them the whole skill set, but I think we're trying to help them build up their confidence to be able to ask the questions they had to ask. Whether that worked or not, I don't know. Uh, but we certainly gave them the tools to try to do it. So they've been, and this mission has supported them for uh, a decade to that point. But w f in terms of physical resources, how, how impoverished is, is this military at the time you were there? It's, well, it's apparently less impoverished than it used to be, uh, but it's, it's, it's broken. It's, uh, it's got weapons and it's got some trucks and it's got some uniforms and it's a shell of an army. You know, really it's, uh, what is the army in Sierra Leone? It's a great job. 
It's a job that gets you paid every month, hopefully. It's a job that maybe gets you your bag of rice and you know, your 100 pound bag of rice that you're entitled to every month, maybe. Um, and, but it's somewhere you can hang your hat for the next 20 years if you live. And your family can get housing and you can get some medical care and that's better than almost every other job in, in Sierra Leone. So that's really what it is. In terms of equipment, uh, in July of, the, uh, July of 2011, late July, myself and uh, a sergeant from the British Army, from uh, the Prince of Wales Regiment, had gone off and done a, uh, a series of inspections with uh, outlying battalions. We had two purposes to the trip. We'd gone out to uh, inspect possible mortar ranges um, for running a mortar course or artillery ranges, uh, and which were, that in itself was, we found ranges that were overgrown and now had people living on them. Uh, military property, which it doesn't get used, people move on to. They become squatters until we move them off. So, you know, we're looking at templating ranges that have villages in them. We're like, oh, that's interesting. And as we run around to the various battalions, we took stock of all the weapons they had. Uh, this was all part of a lead up as well to uh, a possible mission in Somalia with the African Union for Sierra Leone. So as we went around and we checked stock and uh, condition of, of weapons, it was brutal. Uh, just stacks and stacks of AK-47s and FNs, SLRs that were rusted and broken. Some works some didn't. Um, at the time, there were supposed to be, I believe, 18 full uh, C6 machine guns with SF kits. I think we found 12 and I think we found two SF kits in our travels. Uh, mortar tubes, we found some. We didn't find base plates. It was a real, it was a real shambles. So uh, you want to talk about the machine gun range. Talk about that, that, the machine gun course and then the subsequent range. Yeah, well, so we get, um, as the, Ar the ARSLAF decided that uh, they were going to go and support the African Union mission in, Syria, in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya towards fighting with, uh, with Al-Shabaab and stuff. Uh, in order to go there, they never really prepared for war fighting. They'd had a reconnaissance element in Darfur for a while, but that was the only thing that was, was deploying. This was, you know, looking at a battalion level kind of deploying or, or smaller, but was going to go to an area where there was fighting. Uh, so to get them ready, we had to get some training done. Uh, myself and Mike Lacroix, Chief Warrant Officer from the Toronto Scottish, uh, went out and set up uh, a couple of courses. We had to get a, uh, a machine gun instructor course ready. And then we, you know, in order to teach uh, their NCOs how to teach machine guns. So we had to teach them basic machine gunning, followed by the machine gun instructor course and then supervise them teaching their guys basic machine gunning for uh, the C6, which was relatively easy for us to teach them. Uh, but the, the real interesting part was the heavy weapons, the, the 50 cal, the 12.7 uh, that they were using were both the, uh, the Dishka, the Russian version, and the uh, Chinese Type 85. Uh, the, the interesting part, of course, is that neither Mike nor I was qualified in those. So we had to get ourselves down to the Joint Logistics Unit, uh, go sign for those. Uh, put them on top of the Land Rover and drive them back to camp and, and work on them for a couple of weeks and, and get our hands dirty and figure them out. Uh, we were coming back out of the JLU with, uh, with the 12.7, the, the dish gun on the roof, and they were in a security lockdown. And the guy at the gate tells us to open up the boot, the trunk. He wants to see if we're taking anything off the camp. And we're both laughing because we've got 200 pounds of machine gun tied to the roof, but you can look at the boot all you want. So off we went. We got, to, we got back to IMAT, uh, tore the guns apart. And, you know, machine guns are machine guns. They basically work the same way. Uh, these had never been used. These were circa 1974, still in packing grease. We had to come up with a, a diesel Varsol bath, uh, wash them down, get them so that they could work. This is, these were literally brand new weapons built in 1974, never been used. We were the first guys that cracked those cases open since they arrived in Sierra Leone. So I was like, wow, that's great. Uh, they were so rough machined out of, uh, out of Russia. We were filing parts down so they would fit properly. And I remember... Uh, Colonel Jamie Martin from the British Army walking by one day and says to uh, Chief Warrant Officer Kwana, he goes, you guys know what you're doing? I said, well, we're doing okay so far. And we just carried on. Uh, our biggest issue was we didn't have a, uh, an instruction manual. We didn't have the parts manual for the Russian machine gun or for the Chinese one. And we're just wondering how, you know, we look online and see as neither one of us reached Chinese or Russian, the ones we found online weren't going to help us. Uh, so we leaned over and uh, asked somebody who worked over at the U.S. Embassy if they could help us out. And... There's a guy who knows a guy who knows somebody in Langley who, within about a week, a uh, package showed up with all the books we were looking for in English. So that was handy. So we, uh, we got to teaching that. We had to, uh, it was a real education. We got out to uh, Benguema, uh, military base uh, further down the peninsula. Uh, got out there, taught the machine gun instructor course, taught it in, in a Canadian style because we had to be confident that these guys were going to be confident and, and good with the weapons uh, when they were done because they were going to a life and death situation. So we, we pushed these guys pretty hard to, uh, to learn it. Uh, it was a real interesting exercise for them and for the camp where we were working because 
our demands for areas we needed for training and support we needed for training far exceeded what they were normally accustomed to. So we had to provide the budget for food and, and that kind of stuff and make sure that our guys were getting fed. And that in itself was a challenge. You know, we, uh, we turned the money over to the RQ in Benguema under the proviso that he would provide breakfast and lunch and supper. And we arrived on day two and found out that most of our guys didn't eat breakfast. We found out there was no food for them in the kitchen. We had to go talk to the RQ very quietly behind the door and find out that maybe the money didn't make it to where it had to go. So a little... Had to get that solved, eventually got our guys fed, but that was a constant source of irritation. You know, which you would, you hate to think that you have to find out that grown men need to be fed. Uh, but that's, that's the case in Africa. Somebody's looking to make a buck and maybe the food doesn't make it to where it's gotta go. Uh, we wrapped up the instructor course, uh, got that done. Uh, Mike got into teaching the first serial of the, uh, the actual basic, uh, the basic course. I was on leave in, in Europe for a couple of weeks, came back when that wrapped up. I taught the second one as Mike had left to, Mike LaCroix had left to go back to Canada. His mission was over. So I taught the second course out at Benguema uh, with another instructor. It was, it was a good time. It was, uh, we wrapped it up with a good live shoot downrange. Uh, uh, we had to go downrange and set up our own targetry because there's no targetry. You hauled out broken out vehicles and figure 11 targets and a giant stack of computer parts out of Canada because we weren't allowed to bring them back and we couldn't give them to the locals so we made a target out of them which included TVs. I think it broke their heart to watch us shoot up the computers to be honest with you. But uh, put the real targets out there, put the vehicles out there, busted up pickup trucks and stuff and I think the eye-opener for the candidates was seeing the level of damage uh, concentrated machine gun fire could put onto a target. And I think that was, that was a real eye-opener for those guys and understanding the power that was at their fingertips that, that had to be used very carefully in a life and death situation. So that was, uh, that was a great part of teaching that, uh, of, the, of the deployment. I, I'm just curious about the challenges of instructing uh, these Africans, yeah. many of whom are illiterate, Yeah, that's when, yeah. It, when it comes to machine guns and all that. What was that like? It's, that, was, that was a real challenge. I think, you know, like I alluded to before, we had to lower our expectation level. But we also had to bring everything down to the basics. Uh, and the real trick of where we would assume in Canada, guys would go back and read the, the publication or the, the pamphlets that we gave them, the handouts. We couldn't rely on that there. We couldn't give them information to read. Uh, most of the guys were illiterate. You know, a handful of guys could read, but we can't trust them to read to everybody else. Guys are tired at the end of the day. It's, it's you know, malaria wears them down, malnutrition wears them down. Um, you know, the, the environment wears them down, the weather wears them down, whatever reasons. And some guys were working, you know, doing little jobs in town while they were on course. So we really do to be, run this like we would with any other course, but really slow it down. A lot more repetition, a lot more working through the basics, a lot of, uh, we didn't get into a lot of the complex stuff with uh, support fire and interlocking fire and trying to design, you know, building up a, a, like a machine gun platoon or a defense position. We had to keep it real simple. Here's your target, here's how you get to it. Uh, even explaining indirect fire took some imagination. Uh, it was, they really had a hard time understanding the concept that you could shoot at something that you couldn't see. That was, that was just unknown to them. They were just like, well, what do you mean? Well, explaining that a bullet will go up and come down was like, well, no, it moves in a straight line. I went, well, it moves in a straight line this way, but it goes up and down. And they just, it was really impossible to try to explain that to them. And you could show them all the diagrams, you explain it, but they were never really going to understand it. So you kind of had to put that aside and, and stick to direct fire and focus on that. And we really had to slow, excuse me, slow the skill set down. A lot of repetition at every level. Uh, you know, a repetition for the candidates, repetition for the instructors to make sure that everybody understood it. And the real challenge with the instructors was not letting them slip into traditional Sierra Leone teaching habits where you could smack the guy in the head and you know, a little bit of physical motivation here and there. And we try to keep the focus on delivering the product. What about, uh, just last question, but the, and you can be as specific or non-specific as you want, but the, uh, the, the challenges of running a, a heavy machine gun range in a training area that's not necessarily close to the public. Well, you know, it's uh, just the simple rifle range, and I'll get into the machine gun range, but even the basic rifle range, we have to announce that we're going out that way. And then we get in and fire a couple of warning shots off, wait 15 minutes, and then start firing. In the machine gun range, this was a templated range that uh, people would, you know, we drove out there to take a look around. There were guys working in the background. They were, you know, they were rock breaking, uh, taking big rocks, turning them into little rocks and using a hammer and then sell the gravel and then cutting down trees. And some people were trying to farm and people were living out there. So we had to go out, sweep the area, find out who was living there, 
talk to the local RSLAF to get it cleared out. Uh, they broadcast for about a week on a local radio telling them that there would be live fire. And again, we had to go check to make sure there's nobody there. But it's not like it is in, in North America. We, don't, we could not just drive up and start shooting. We had to physically go check to make sure the range was empty. Um, that worked okay during the day. It was generally okay. Uh, our problem came to, uh, to nighttime at the, the first course where there was a, uh, as the day shoot wrapped up and everybody had dinner, we waited for dusk uh, to get into the night, the night firing, which by the way, uh, no illumination. So you make your own illumination. And if burning tires in the back of a truck works over there, it probably doesn't work here, but it worked over there. Our problem then was as, uh, as they opened fire for the, the night shoot, uh, there was some screaming from downrange, and it turned out some kids had gone onto the range, uh, looking for checking out the targets, picking up scrap metal, whatever. Uh, luckily, they had hunkered down at a low bit of ground, and, and everybody checked fire. Everybody you know everybody's safe. But that's the nature of working over there. You just never know. Uh, you don't know what's going to be downrange. You hope it's right. Uh, it'd be you know it'd be horrible to live with, but it's the nature of, of the environment they're in. And were you um, were you there when they ran the uh, the mortar course, eighty one course? Yeah, when we when I did ran the second course, the uh, uh, some members from the Parachute Regiment in the British Army had come over working with uh, uh, W02 Dean Stokes out of the British Army were teaching uh, an 81 millimeter mortar course uh, to also get the African U uh, this RSLAF guys ready for the AU mission. Uh, so that was running uh, to our left on the range. They had run you know, in, on Big Guayma for a while. So we tied our shoots together uh, to do the shoot with the intent that they could put uh, explosive fire into the wood line behind our target tree and we kind of do a combined arm shoot and give people a better sense of how the mission would work. Uh, we also wanted to use illumination which was uh, I'm gonna say probably 30 percent effective not all the rounds were uh, were they good. Again they were working with tubes that were you know decades old and ammo that was just as old. Uh, to be honest with you they had an 81 millimeter Romanian tube with 80 millimeter Chinese ammo so it's good thing it didn't go the other way but it's yeah we ran work that concurrently as best we could but it was actually uh, it gave, I think, everybody a better sense of how things worked. Uh, probably the weirdest thing was, as we know in Canada, we do range maintenance, come out the next day and pick up our brass and our target tree and clear the range. We came out the next morning to clean that range. The locals had picked that thing clean. There wasn't link left, there wasn't brass, the targets were gone. It was as if we had never been there. You want to talk about uh, your trip to Ghana? Yeah, myself and uh, the task force chief warrant officer started working on professional development for the NCO Corps. And we kind of were kind of reaching out to see if who we could take that message to. And we lucked out that we were able to get an invite to go to Ghana and deal with the Armed Forces Chief and the Army Chief, uh, their Navy and Air Force Chief. So it was a real, uh, a real plus for us. Actually, the, uh, the Brennan SEALs were quite envious. They had never given the opportunity in the time they were there to travel as representatives to another African nation uh, on behalf of IMAT. So myself and uh, Derek Monroe uh, flew to Accra. Uh, we were met by the Forces Chief's uh, driver. And the next day went in, met him. Uh, Edu Yao uh, met his, uh, his three uh, element chief warrant officers, went to their version of Gagetown, uh, got the tour there, met their NCOs, and, and really talked about what we were trying to deliver in Sierra Leone, how we were trying to uh, build up their NCO Corps, and what kind of message we were delivering there, and how they were doing training there. Uh, they're a much more sophisticated army, sophisticated armed forces than Sierra Leone. Still wanting by Western standards, but pretty well checked out. They, they have some pretty good reciprocal agreements with uh, with France, who was supplying them with aircraft. So they had a French language school at, at the at the base. Uh, there was a German language school because the German Navy was providing ships. Uh, so they had some, some real technical expertise. A lot of exchanges. Uh, their uh, Army Chief traditionally goes to the U.S. Army Sergeant Major Academy, and they deployed to places like Lebanon as the Force Sergeant Major. So a much more sophisticated army to work with. But in many ways, much like Sierra Leone, the NCO Corps wasn't always trusted and it was building up its respect level. But it was certainly an eye opener to go to a country that paved roads, running water, generally had electricity, but a, uh, a much more uh, uh, functional working NCO Corps. So it was, that was a real eye opener, but it was, it was a good chance to get over there and, and see how another African army worked. And they're still very much along the British model. Uh, well, they originally were. They're, they're a little more along. Uh, I'm going to say there's, there's probably a good blend between the British and American model. They, they've certainly taken a lot of the lessons learned from the U.S. Army Sergeant Major Academy and brought them back. But their structure is similar to the British Army. So you can see that it's still their colonial tie to it, and, and they're familiar with it. But they're evolving as they work with other nations and bringing those lessons back. So good for them. So how would you describe your, um, maybe your mood on your arrival there in terms of your motivation 
and maybe midway through, two thirds of the way through, was was it evolving or how was it evolving in terms of? I got I got fortunate that I did, ended up doing different jobs. I think if I'd done the academy sergeant major job for the six or seven months, I probably would have had some peaks and valleys of of getting bored with the job. But I lucked out that it was kind of a transitional period when I got there. I was able to run the course I got to run, uh, work with the officers course. The school went into kind of a summer shutdown. I worked with. Uh, with the British uh, NCOs to work on the uh, the range project and traveling around, and then started to get ready for the machine gun course. Got that going, working with the school at the same time, and then you know refocused by going over to Ghana and working with that for a little while. So I, I was kind of lucky that I was kind of motivated throughout. Uh, there were some personality issues that kind of ticked me off here and there, but you know, that's another story for another day. I'll leave those names out of the out of the equation, but. Uh, you know, you, you do your good work and you try to get it out there and you hope that nobody screws you on it, but that doesn't always happen. Are there um, any other incidents that are still in your memory, uh, memorable to you? Well, I think, you know, uh, like, like I alluded to before, we, you know, we, we sort of dropped the barrier, reduced the barrier of, of being the Canadians that were kind of standoffish. We had a good group there. Uh, we ran a hell of a Canada Day party we had, uh, down at the pool and, and got some, some cool stuff done, we got some stuff brought in. and. You know, we had uh, beef jerky come in for Wainwright and, you know, there was a quiz and we had, we had a pretty good day and all the locals and the NGOs came in, the Americans were there and I think everybody had a good chance to, to do some stuff. The boys uh, managed to rig up a, uh, a bull in the pool with a 55 gallon drum and some ropes and see if people wanted to ride the stampede bull because of course uh, myself and the uh, force commander were both from Calgary so it's a Calgary stampede theme party, too bad, that's the way it is. So that worked out quite nicely. Uh, probably the one thing that did stick out was uh, we did, I did manage to get a, uh, a brand new barbecue delivered to, uh, to Sierra Leone, which is a story in itself. Uh, when I arrived, I saw the, the barbecue that we did have, which I still have photos of. Uh, they're on the stick I gave you. Uh, it was a health hazard at every level. There was uh, nobody should be cooking on it, cooking near it, or eating near it. Uh, and I had a friend of mine from business back in Calgary who said, look, if you get there, need anything, drop me a line. So we're just emailing back and forth, and I said, how things are going? And he says, you need anything? I said, ah, just kidding, could use a brand new barbecue. And I sent him a picture of the one we had, and I left it at that. And about a week later, I get an email from him. He goes, hey, I bought this barbecue, uh, you know, $2,000 Weber barbecue. He goes, how do I ship it? Well, therein begins the adventure. Because I'm thinking, okay. So he, he says, how do you ship it? I said, well, we ship it DHL. So he checks DHL Express, and he emails me back, and he goes, it's going to cost 14000 bucks to ship a $2,000 barbecue. Now, you know, great guy, because he said, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. I said, just relax, we'll see what we can do. Uh, we got a hold of the QM officer, uh, Major Rock. I said, you know, hey, how do we get this thing shipped? Well, it's uh, much like a story on a MASH or, you know, Catch-22. It was, uh, he, uh, he put us in touch with uh, a former girlfriend living in London, England, who worked for DHL, who in turn put us in touch with a former girlfriend of his living in Calgary working for DHL who eventually we were able to get my guy in touch with and long, you know, uh, some souls had to be sold and some F1 tickets for the, the F1 race in Belgium had to go to the person in, in England and hockey jerseys changed hands and it was just, it was a sad tale at so many levels. Eventually we got a ship for about 2,600 bucks. Uh, but knowing that the shiny object was coming to Africa, we had to make sure that somebody met it at the airport so we had our courier meet it, uh, get it in the truck and hand carry it. And we followed that thing like we were tracking the space shuttle. We wanted to know exactly where it was in Sierra Leone until it arrived at, on our, our doorstep. And this busted up van that's smoking because the, the rad's gonna blow up, leaks its way into camp and parks and the guys are just, they're, they're dying for moving this thing. And we probably got it at about 11 to 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, and like kids at Christmas. We ripped that box open and built that bad boy right there. And the, the funny part is, is so we, we got this technological mastery, this, this great, barbecue that shows up that in Canada you'd be like amazed with. The, in order to make it work in Africa, we had to cut the, the brand new regulator off and attach a regulator from a 1974-75 circa propane tank like a pig nose in order to get propane to work. It was the only way to make it work. But that being said, we had, we had a great barbecue. We had a great uh, uh, barbecue on a, the following Saturday. We roasted what were called steaks and had everybody over. So I think uh, it greatly improved morale for the Canadian mission. What's the story behind the uh, the white Stetsons that you also managed to procure? Well, we did manage to get some uh, some white Stetsons, like you know the traditional white uh, Smith built Stetsons out of out of Calgary. We, uh, you know, we tried to get them initially over for the Stampede. It didn't show up. They were a little late getting. Uh, we worked at a deal out with the uh, the MFRC in Calgary to to get them shipped over. Uh, 
that bill got eventually got paid. Not that I'm too impressed with how that worked out, but we did get a, a bunch of hats to come over for the Canadians and to hand off to some Brits. And we still have a great photo of uh, myself, uh, yourself, uh, Derek Monroe down at uh, RS Live headquarters with uh, a bunch of the general staff and the uh, the defense minister standing around in, in the noonday sun in early October wearing Stetsons at, uh, in the middle of Africa. It's, uh, that's on my wall and it still stands out pretty good. So at the end of this all, how, uh, how are you feeling about the contribution you've made? I was, I was pretty happy. I think, you know, I, I, like I said, I was, I was fortunate to do a bunch of different things. And uh, I was able to, I think, whether we move the yard markers, I don't know. Uh, but I, I think that I know in my heart that we gave them good skills. I did see some progress. I did see some guys uh, later on in the mission who were working in their, their jobs and their units uh, who were trying to move the yard six themselves. So I was happy that at least some of those guys got the message. I think the older guys on the certain major course weren't going to get it. It was, they were there punching a ticket. But the younger guys, the the staff sergeants and such, they were the they were the future of that NCO corps. And I can see that they were trying hard to make it work. So I was always quite happy with what I delivered. Uh, quite happy that I worked outside the norm of certainly what the British uh, lieutenant colonel I was working for at the staff college, who really uh, was uncomfortable with Canadian NCOs trying to develop their own briefing notes and and come up with, with plans on how to move the, the NCO Corps, but too bad. That's how we work, and, and that's what I was delivering. So I, I was quite happy with what I delivered. Uh, what about the professional relationships you made with your uh, fellow Canadians, the Brits, the Americans? Uh, I'm still friends with a lot of the, uh, with a bunch of the Brits. We're still in touch. Uh, you know, a couple of guys were really, really good. Uh, I think I had, I'm a pretty outgoing guy, pretty social guy. Uh, get out, talk to a lot of people, and, and uh, I guess, uh, you know, I guess you, you gauge your success by if people still want to talk to you. And at the end of the day, uh, as each of the Brits was doing their departures, I get invited to all those, which is good. Maybe not all our other NCOs got invited, but I take that as a mark that I become friends with these guys. Uh, with the Canadians, uh, pretty good. I think there's, there's the majority of the guys are okay. I think there's one or two that I think, you know, friction points exist wherever you work. And that those were probably going to exist, so it is what it is. You're never going to come home as a big happy family, but if eight out of eleven or nine out of eleven were, were people I can get along with, that's great. So, what was it like coming home after that focus in that in that part of the world? Now you're back in Calgary. Well, I arrived in, in Sierra Leone in May in, in the rainy season, which, by the way, I wouldn't recommend that arriving in the rainy season and just finding out how much it rains in Africa. Uh, and when I left, uh, I guess around the twelfth of December. Uh, I arrived back in Canada and obviously in, in Calgary. Uh, a little precursor to that though, uh, the intent was only to be on the mission for seven months. Uh, about a week and a half before redeploying, I was approached by the, uh, the British colonel running the mission. Uh, my civilian background was working in construction management, uh, overseeing major construction projects, that kind of thing. Uh, and he approached me based on my experience to see if I was interested in overseeing the construction of a, uh, a training facility for uh, fighting in built-up areas, to build a small village to fight in so that the African Union mission would have that training before they deployed. Uh, and also being involved on the mission at the overseeing some of the contract work for the, uh, the Grafton Scout Camp, which was kind of our, uh, our feel-good project, about a little, our little CIMIC project to, to rebuild some of the, the infrastructure. So I, I had a good background with that, and that was, that was a, a, a pretty successful part of our mission. So I agreed right away and said, yeah, sure, I'll go. Uh, phoned my wife after that. In hindsight, maybe not the best way that I approached that. Uh, I had phoned her about a week and a half before returning home. She thought I was going to give her details about my flight and stuff. And I said, hey, I agreed to come back for three more months. It's a bit of a long pause. I had to uh, zip downtown to see Ali, the, uh, the local jeweler, and uh, buy a relatively large diamond ring and bring it back as a gift, a uh, bit of a peace offering. Uh, that seemed to work, by the way, so that's okay. <laughs> but arriving back in Canada, you know, it's pre-Christmas, uh, it's kind of a weird time, you know, it's, uh, everybody's going on leave from the military, so you're not seeing those guys. You rush up to Edmonton, you do your out clearance for the mission, which in my case was kind of a holding pattern, just I'm back, check me out, I'm back, and I'm going again. And then you go on leave. Uh, all that while, while I'm on leave, I'm getting fed mission information about the construction project. So while I should be relaxing, I'm getting pretty excited about what I'm returning to. So I was getting fed the, uh, the construction plans and the intent and stuff. So I started building up budgets and, and templates of stuff I needed to take with me. So while it was leave, I could tell that my wife wasn't thrilled that I was kind of doing mission stuff while I was at home, but what are you going to do? So how did that project go when you returned? 
Well, the project itself was interesting. I think the, uh, you know, you want to talk humorous things. I went, uh, uh, you talk about bad timing, you know, bad timing on the call to my wife. Bad timing on the return trip was uh, picking a flight the day after the Burns dinner. So I'd attended the Robbie Burns dinner on the Friday night with the regiment and had a great time, only to be on a 21-hour flight the next day. So in retrospect, that may not have been my best move. <laughs> Uh, that being said, I did get an email before I went back that uh, we were hosting, I was going to host a, uh, a Robbie Burns dinner in, uh, in Freetown on the camp. So uh, I got asked if, uh, if I would come back and uh, A, do the address to the haggis, which I was more comfortable to do, and if I could bring a five pound haggis back. So I thought, well, this should be a challenge. So uh, it, I went down to uh, Timmy Kewins here in Calgary and picked up a five pound haggis and froze it solid, just as solid as it could be, and packed it into a uh, a barrack box that surrounded it with some styrofoam to keep it cool and probably threw in about 10 pounds of bacon in a case of 24 Canadians to go with it. I was taken back. Now that I knew how customs worked, I knew what I could get away with. So packed all that stuff in there, froze it solid, and hoped that it would stay as frozen as it could. Uh, got into Sierra Leone, actually got into London, waiting for my flight. I ran into uh, uh, a sergeant from, the, from IMAT who was returning, who had a couple of three pound haggises he was bringing back from Liverpool. So we kind of covered it from two ends. So we brought uh, all this haggis into Freetown about a week before uh, the Burns dinner there. So it was a good laugh. We did manage to hold the, the, the Burns supper. I did do the address of the haggis. Uh, although I, the, uh, the British Colonel was gonna take the piss out of me because we're all set up and he says, and he introduces me and he goes, so in, in typical IMAT fashion, we have a, a Canadian NCO who was born in French part of Canada, going to give a, a, a Gaelic speech and a room full of people who are Africans and, and, and British. So that, well, great. Thanks for setting that up for me. That's awesome. Uh, did a real, I, it, in my own opinion, did a pretty good job. And actually, in the opinion of others in the room, did a pretty good job. Uh, hit it out of the park, uh, drank some of the Colonel's whiskey, took it off his table because I needed it for the toast. Uh, but it was, all in all, it was a great night. Everybody enjoyed the haggis, enjoyed the whiskey, enjoyed the camaraderie. So it was, it was a good time. Uh, with regards to the job I went over for, the intent was to build a, uh, basically a, a small village. I had a budget of about 250,000 uh, pounds to go and build a village that we could train the RSLF in fighting built-up areas. So I looked at different models of what we could do. I kind of had a sense of wanting to build a triangular village with a bit of a Shura market in the middle uh, out of sea containers. So I would have to get uh, concrete foundations put in, like little corner points, put all the sea cans on those. Uh, cut the sea cans, doors, windows, stack them as best I can. And bear in mind, there's really no heavy equipment. You know, I've got one, uh, one bulldozer and one forklift at my disposal that we're borrowing. Uh, the, the bulldozer belonged to IMAT, uh, which we couldn't find the first day we needed it. We did discover it was down at the uh, Minister of National Defense House digging a pool. We did uh, manage to get that back after much protest uh, and had to, to, to work that piece. I went and cut a contract with a local contractor uh, to get material and manpower and uh, but that was an adventure. It was, uh, construction over there is not like construction here, obviously. Uh, you know, hiring local guys about a buck a day, maybe, two bucks a day for the foreman. And I, you can't pay them more, you know. And I'm dealing with CETA and DFATE here in Canada who are talking on the phone going, well, you got to pay them more because that's what we pay them. I said, you can't. If I pay the guy more, he's got more money than the chief in the village. He becomes the chief. So I can't upset the local economy. I can't upset the apple cart. And they just didn't get it, but that's the way it is. Uh, concrete made on site, bricks made on site. Uh, you have to bring everything in, get the water, get the power, get the get all the stuff you need. It's uh, It was really rudimentary, basic construction 101 at, at all levels. Uh, I'm not an engineer by any sense of any standard, but I went out and had to shoot all my own survey, get all my own levels done, plot the entire site, get all the foundations in, oversee the construction. Uh, getting the sea containers proved to be the Achilles heel of the mission. We had worked with uh, the U.S. Army uh, aid group that was over there, whose name escapes me right now, um, to get the sea cans. So they kind of deal with kind of a Halliburton kind of agency they use, uh, Pacific something. Uh, we wire transferred them 90,000 US dollars to get 36 to 40 sea cans. Un you know, not seaworthy sea cans out of the port. Uh, that's the deal. My sea cans start showing up two weeks later. Great, I'm in business. Well, about a couple of days after that, the uh, the local Sierra Leone police show up uh, while I'm back in camp, and I get a phone call from my local foreman, you know, local dude, pre pretty nice guy, who calls me up and goes, "Sa, I have the police here." I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Your sea containers are stolen." I'm like, 
no, they're not. He goes, Sa. they wish to arrest me. Sa. I'm like, yeah, it's, uh, let me talk to the guy. So I get the detective on the phone and he's telling me, oh, the containers are stolen. I was like, well, I'm, I'm telling you they're not. I got a receipt for how we got them. And he says, well, why don't you come out here and talk to me? I'm like, I am not driving out to Benguema to talk to a bunch of Sierra Leone cops in the edge of the jungle and be the only white guy out there with no protection. So I said, tell you what, why don't you come on down and talk to me here at, at IMAT? And he says, well, we can meet at Pademba, which is where they have their headquarters. Pademba is also the prison. I have no desire to go meet them at the prison to discuss the short route to the prison. So again, I got a hold of the chief of staff from the British Army with us, our legal advisor, uh, discussed the situation and said, no, you guys got to come to us. So they did. Uh, while, while we're waiting for them, we've done our homework. I chased, you know, I got our proof of the wire transfer and stuff. What we did discover, though, was that our U.S. aid guys had subcontracted that to somebody else who had turned subcontracted and subcontracted and subcontracted it. I cannot say hand on heart whether those were stolen sea containers, but I can say hand on heart that I didn't pay for them to get stolen. I paid for them to come from somebody else who may or may not have arranged to get them stolen. So all in all, it looked like a bit of a shakedown more than an actual bit of detective work. So uh, our detectives show up, and I'll use the words detective loosely. Uh, they show up in there. They're immediately on the offensive that I've broken the law and I've arranged for steel containers to be stolen and I have to go to jail. So I hand them a piece of paper with the wire transfer information and the guy holds it up and he turns it sideways and he turns it over another 90 degrees, at which point I realize he can't read the document I gave him. So I just take that back and realize that the written evidence is going to be nothing at this point. Uh, they went on their way and said, we'll be in touch. And they really weren't. Uh, they had a couple of calls here and there. But at the end of the day, they couldn't prove where the sea cans came from. It was like, like all good things in Africa. The, the discussion ended with, I'm sure we can come to an arrangement. And I know what that means. And we weren't paying for the arrangement. So off they went. Uh, the next day, myself and uh, a British major who I was working with, Drove out of camp, we went out the front gate on our way out to, to Hastings where we were working. And we noticed a, a red Honda CRV outside. And you get used to pattern of life. You leave the base at the same time every day, roughly. You know which vehicles you see on the road, you know which people are pushing a cart. Kind of things stick, you, you know what the routine is. We had never seen that CRV before and he noticed it as well. So as we, we did our left turn to go down the peninsula, the CRV pulled in right behind us. So I said, okay, maybe that's a coincidence. And then Graham had a phone call. So we pulled over because you can't talk on a phone on the Land Rover. It's virtually impossible. It's too loud. We pulled over to the edge of a driveway, and lo and behold, the CRV pulled in right behind us. Very stealthy guy, not so good on the tailing. Uh, so we realized right away what's going on. Uh, we went to go back to talk, and we rolled the windows up. So we took off again. And we got to the edge of Regent, which is a small village. And there's a little one-vehicle uh, one bridge that crosses the creek, kind of the river, the creek there. So we waited for uh, the traffic to get across the bridge, and it was piling up behind us. And we, we darted across that bridge we, and floored it. And we watched the guy floor it behind us. And we hammered the brakes at the far end of it. No one full well that the car behind him would have come in as well. So the guy tailing us is now boxed on the bridge. He can't get out. So we both get out and walk back. And he's trying to roll the window up as fast as he can. And we ask him what's going on. He says, well, I'm with the Sierra Leone police. And I've been told to follow you. They're like, dude, you're driving a busted up CRV. And we got 30 Ks of hard jungle road to go. And I'm driving a Land Rover. Good luck. <laughs> So we dropped the hammer and took off and lost him in about a K and, you know, just good police wing because we, we had to drive by the Waterloo police station to get there or the, uh, the Grafton police station to, to get to Hastings. You know, you think he would have called ahead and had them waiting for us. There was nobody on the road. We just drove right by the police station. So the next couple of weeks were, uh, it was pretty dicey from that perspective. It was a little unnerving. Everywhere I went, there was usually somebody following me. Uh, so I basically spent the last three weeks or so in Africa, not going anywhere on my own. I made sure I was going with somebody in another vehicle. You know, it really restricted my movements so I wouldn't get picked up by the, by the, the Sierra Leone police. They were really pushing hard to arrest somebody for the theft of the sea cans, even though there really was no theft. They wanted their arrangement, and it wasn't going to happen. Uh, it eventually got to the point that uh, I had pretty much wrapped up construction. There was a little bit left to go with some painting and uh, some minor touch-up stuff, so I handed that off to a, a Canadian captain who was on the mission. We cut my time short. Uh, I had the, uh, the British military police major and a couple other guys escort me as far as the, as far as the airport to once I got inside the airport, the SLP could really do nothing. So I was inside the airport, got checked in in a lounge on a plane and happy to be out of there. So it was, uh, that was pretty unnerving. I think it's, I talked to my wife about it on the phone and she was really concerned about the, if, 
you know, you get bit by snakes, you get bit by spiders, you could die in a car accident. She goes, but the thought of going to prison in Africa really wasn't thrilling anybody. <laughs> I'd like to hear your take on uh, just uh, the culture, the, the superstitious culture that is. Uh, the, 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 the kind of the voodoo culture. Yeah. Uh, I, sp I spend a lot of time talking to a lot of people. I'm a guy that gets out and talks to folks. And, you know, you talk to the bartender, talk to the waitress, talk to the, excuse me, the NCOs. You want to know what's going on. And, and you kind of hear that there's a witchcraft culture there, but you really don't see it in Freetown. You don't, you don't know what you're looking for. And so you talk to people and I think, uh, you can unnerve people with what you don't realize are little things that happen in our lives. Uh, I'm a twin. I have, a, I have an identical twin brother. Uh, and superstition for a long time in, in, in parts of Africa, and particularly in, in Western Africa and Sierra Leone, uh, when twins were born, and this goes back decades, obviously, it allegedly doesn't happen currently, uh, one twin would be, would be killed at birth and the other one would live. Uh, they would kill the evil twin and keep the, the good twin alive. Which, of course, led to the question when I asked somebody, I said, how do you know you killed the evil one? Well, the good one's alive. Well, that's, that's good thinking. So I, I, I mentioned that while they're discussing this, I said, well, I'm a twin. And she, the, the woman says, well, it's, well you, you're alive. That's good. I said, well, my brother's alive as well. And there was a little, uh, the look of shock on her face was like, what? I'm like, yeah, well, we're both alive. He's in Afghanistan right now and I'm here. And, and no, my mother didn't kill one of us. So that was a bit of a, that threw them off for a little bit. So they kind of live with that. You've got that. I'm like, okay, good. Uh, you don't want to be an albino in, in parts of Africa at, at some point, apparently. Uh, again, old, uh, old customs, old, uh, old cultural issue that uh, albinos were, were often killed. They were kind of hunted down and killed, and it was, uh, it was considered good luck to actually eat one. So I don't think you wanted to be an albino in parts of Africa. And as much as people say, oh, that can't be the case, there was a recent article in the National Post talking about how this is still underway in West Africa. So I remember when I came back and I told people, they were like, no, oh, you're full of crap. And I showed somebody the article about a month ago, and they're like, oh, okay, apparently you're not full of crap. Uh, probably the, the funniest one to, to kind of get your head around is, uh, is the voodoo culture, something called the witch gun. Uh, there's, there's a big belief that people don't just get sick. They get sick because somebody wished them to be sick. So if you have a cold or you have a flu, it's because somebody wanted you to have the flu for whatever, whatever nefarious reason. Now to make that happen, they have to use something called a witch gun. So I thought, okay, well, somebody explained to me the witch gun. So I, again, I had talking to locals and they're, they're explaining the whole thing. I'm like, so what's the deal? They said, well, you, you go and see the, the local shaman or whoever you want to see, the, the, the mother, and you say that you, you wish a curse on Mike and, you know, you wish him to be sick. So somebody uses a witch gun. I said, well, what's a witch gun? I said, oh, it could be anything. It could be an umbrella, it could be a pen, it could be a stick. But they use it to, to throw the curse at the guy. I'm like, okay, if that works for you. But there's, there's a firm belief that people just don't get sick. They just don't have bad luck. It's, it's forced on them by, by the bad wishes of someone else. Uh, and it, it really takes root in, in a lot of the remote villages. The further away you get from Freetown, the more the, the voodoo witchcraft culture is out there. It's, it's, it's there. You can see that there, you know, there's villages where, where children are getting sick or going missing, and they'll bury talismans in a box to, to build a barrier around the town. Or if they don't want a, a certain developer or something to come to town, they, they ward them off by burying these talismans in a in kind of a circle around the village. It's, it's really something to, to kind of get your head around. I think some Canadians and, and some Brits kind of shake it off. Yeah, yeah, whatever, I think. But it's important for us to understand the cultures that we go into to kind of get us, you know, you don't look down on it. It's, it's like I've always said about people is that, uh, I'm not a religious guy by, by nature, but I believe that everybody has their own God or their own person, their own deity that they want to believe in. And that's great. That's, if that's what makes you comfortable, good for you. And I, I'm not knocking that for anybody. That's the way things are. And in this culture, if this is what these people rely on to give them uh, a sense of stability or a sense of purpose, then that's what it is. They really don't have anything else. So if that's where they're going to, that's where they're going to. Can you, uh, in relation to that, can you tell the story about the... Uh the sacrifice of the white bull. Were you there for that? No, that happened for you. That so happened before I got. No, that's not true. There was. There was. I, I think I wasn't there for that. I, I knew it was going to happen. Oh yeah, that's right. There was. There was. A, there was sickness going around. Yeah, the sort of in-service deaths. Yeah, there were a lot of in-service deaths. There were a lot of guys who were working in the arts life who were dying. Uh, you know, it was probably malaria. To be honest with you, These guys get malaria. They get what they get. Uh, you know, we're fortunate that we take anti-malarial meds. Uh, they get nothing. They kind of, you get it. Malaria is kind of like frostbite. You get it once, you're probably getting it again. Uh, there were a lot of in-service deaths over a period of time. 
in order to ward that off. The actual, the, uh, the army commander, the CDS and the minister decided that there was a need for an actual sacrifice. So they sacrificed a white bull or a white cow. Um, I think in downtown Freetown, down in the town, kind of the town, near the cotton tree kind of area, sacrificed this thing in order to ward off the evil spirits. So it's, this isn't always just in the hinterland out in the villages. There's a belief that if you can't fix something, it's probably going to require some magic or some voodoo to sort it out. So I dare say that we're glad we weren't there for the Ebola crisis to figure out what was getting slaughtered to solve that. How do you feel, uh, how do you feel about Africa, that part of Africa now? Do you have any desire, for example, to, to go back? I'd go back in a heartbeat. It drives my wife insane. Uh, I was really enamored with the country, with the culture. Uh, I would easily have gone back over. If the mission was still on, I'd still be volunteering to go. Even though I'm retired now, but uh, if I was still in, I'd be asking to go. Uh, I really liked it. I really liked that there, uh, uh, there's so much more I wanted to see. I think the, we know so much about the other parts of the world and Africa is still the large unknown. Even though we'd been, you know, Canada had been in Sierra Leone for 10 years, it's even for the, the 400 some odd guys who've been on that mission, we're a, we're a real minority. A lot of people don't even know the mission existed. And it was a great mission. I think if you go back to its roots, uh, when guys like Don Schaefel, Shaky Schaefel, went there in 2000 on, on Roto 1, Roto 0, you know, at the time they had just come out of Civil War and there was a, a very shaky peace. And Canada had sent a part of the initial observation mission went in. And this, I remember Don, and there was a great interview with, uh, the magazine that used to come out with the National Post on the weekends. I think it was called Saturday or whatever. Don did a, did a really good interview about when he came back. And, and Don, is a, he's a guy who'd been in the Army close to 30 years and hard as nails, kind of Pathfinder Sergeant Major guy out of the Airborne Regiment. And I remember talking to him because he was in Wainwright when I was there. And, and he came back and said, the eye-opener for him in Sierra Leone was he'd spent 25 to 30 years teaching Canadians, Canadian kids off the street, how to become soldiers and how to kill. And he goes, that's, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's an honorable profession, but it's weird. He says, when he got to Sierra Leone and he started working with them, he goes, he realized that the shoe was on the other foot. He had kids who were trained killers who he had to teach how to be soldiers. And he goes, it was a real turnaround of, of perspective and understanding what, what mankind is capable of. So young kids and teenagers who had already spent a year or two years killing people in the woods, in the, in the jungle, trying to defend their own villages and cities, who they were trying to militarize and they put it to uniforms. So uh, there's so much of that place and so much of the mission we don't know and so much of what we don't understand about African culture that I was really drawn to it. I'd go back tomorrow. And uh, how do you think that, ex that experience has uh, affected, changed you as a person, uh, as a soldier? I think as a soldier, it brought my understanding of, of getting away from delivering the stuff like we, we normally do. You know, we have a formula to deliver training and we're kind of, you know, we're, here's our here's the way we do things. Step one, step two, step three. And I got a better understanding of, sometimes we have to sort of throw away the rule book and, and understand that what we deliver is based on the people that are getting it. And sometimes we have to, to get away of, out of our normal routine and our comfort zone to make sure that the message is delivered. I think for me personally, <coughs> it was a, uh, a real eye-opener to understanding what the other parts of the world look like. You know, I had traveled a lot, but mostly in Europe, almost extensively in Europe, the United States. I'd never been to Africa. And understanding the level of destitution, the level of poverty uh, was, was a real eye-opener. It was shocking. I think there's, there's a real need when you get to a place like, like Africa, uh, especially in Sierra, Sierra Leone, which was at the time the fifth poorest country in the world. You have to disassociate yourself to a large degree from what you see every day. Uh, you know, kids with the swollen bellies and kids picking through garbage to, to get food or, or stuff to bring back to the house for the day and understanding that that's the way life is. Uh, if you let that get to you, you can't do your job. And we were there for a mission. We had a job to do. Uh, it was, you know, it was, it was a different mission. It was a training mission. It's not, uh, you know, door kicking and gunslinging, but it's still a mission. And if you're focused on how those kids are suffering and how people are just not going to be able to survive and understanding that the mortality rate is massive, you know, it's less than half the kids born at birth are going to make it to the age of five. If you let that get to you, you're not going to be able to deliver your work. And we had people later on when I showed up in the second half, like in 2012, there were a couple of people who really struggled with that, who really couldn't get themselves out of their, their headspace out of that. So I got a real, uh, a real understanding of, of what that level of poverty really is. You know, it's funny, you see it on World Vision commercials and, you know, SOS children. You think, oh, okay, that looks pretty bad. But it's pretty bad when you see it. 
uh, on that note, by the way, I now I now know which charities to give to, which ones not to, because I know where the money goes based on the size of the vehicles in the parking lot at each of those compounds. Uh, the other learning thing for me was, I think the 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 spirit of the people that were there, and as, as hard down as they are, as broken as they are, as broken as their culture is, as broken as their government is, as as corrupt as it is, and Africa is corrupt as hell. Uh, there's they're just happy people. They get up, they go to work every day, they go to school. Like the happiest people I saw every day on the road were kids in their little uniforms that get that cleaned, who have their little matching school uniforms, walking down the dirt road with their books and their their pencil and whatever. And that's the best thing they're gonna do all day. And they're happy, they're happier than pigs and shit walking down that road. And I thought it was great to see these kids every day. And each school had its own different uniforms, different colors, and you kind of knew what zones you were in based on the you know the colors of the uniforms of the kids. But it was great. It was I think to me that was the big thing was understanding the human spirit uh as bad as the situation could be there's it can pull itself up out of the mud when it wants to and that was that was i think for me that was very enlightening is there anything that i haven't asked you about that you uh you want to finish on uh well we did pretty good on uh, on trivia <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> the occasion to get down to uh down to the pub down by the uh down in freetown on, on thursday night quiz night and and kick the crap out of the local folks and get our, you know, try to win our uh, our two million Sierra Leones and our Leones and, and buy some Heineken beer. But uh, no, other than that, I think is I think I've covered a lot of the stuff I want to cover. I think it's uh, it was an interesting mission. It was it was challenging. Uh, I challenged myself by wanting to do things outside of my norm. You know, my the guy that replaced me uh, at the school certain major level was that's all he wanted to do. He, when I got back and saw him in 2012. He, that's all he was doing. He had no interest to go teach other courses, no interest to leave the camp. Uh, he was strictly, I'll run the, the school sergeant major job and that's all I'm gonna do. So but if, that's, if that's what your expectation level is, that's what you do. Uh, I wanted to push myself. I took on more things, sometimes to the chagrin of the British Lieutenant Colonel I worked for, who was, I think, uh, not frustrated, but certainly challenged by my inability to just sit at my desk and do my job. I wanted to do more, uh, but I'm, I'm glad I did. I think. Taking all those challenges, uh, going up country to look at stuff, going to Ghana, uh, teaching the machine gun courses, even though we didn't have to, but we chose to, and then coming back to run the construction project, basically as a civilian in a military uniform, and work with local contractors and stuff. Those are those are all great growth experiences that, if I had insisted on doing just the sergeant major job, I would never have seen half the things. That, I never would have seen eighty percent of the things I saw. So. That's great. Thanks very much. Yeah, no problem.